How are you, Charlene? I'm good, my dear. Congratulations, by the way. Uh, again, the Muscle Shoals be- session. I nearly said what for. <laughs> for. For people who don't know, right, mm-hmm. what is this album? How did it come about? Why is it so special? Where was it recorded? Okay, so basically we have made an album. We went to Alabama to Muscle Shoals um, and to the famous Fame Studios to record with the amazing Spooner Oldham. Spooner Oldham is, uh, he's a wonderful musician. You would probably know him from, he played on the first four Aretha Franklin records. He played on When a Man Loves a Woman at the age of 14. The organ on that. <laughs> he basically, I mean, he's insane. He played on Liberace records. It's like insane. No, it's insane. It's insane. And he's the most humble, beautiful human being you will ever meet. It's it's pretty insane. What was it like being near someone who was near all those other people in the past? (laughs) Do you know what? He's just like, he's just, you know, he's 80 years old now, Spooner. And we turn up, we'd never physically met. We'd spoke on the phone before we went. And basically what happened was, was Kenny Gates, who's the owner of PS Records, our, our record company boss, said, he has this baby that he has his certain artists within the label do this piano record. He asked us maybe like about five years, six years ago, and I was like, yeah, you know, I could make you a record on a piano in two hours, but if we do it, we need to do it really something different. So you have to do it with someone else. So some people do it with a classical penis, some people with a jazz penis. But basically, we says, when we find the right person, we'll do it. And um, Russell, uh, Mary and Arman suddenly, one there had been loads of names came up and we were like, nah, nah, nah. And then suddenly somebody went, Spooner Oldham. And we went, oh my God, Spooner Oldham, really? Yeah. And we thought, he'll never do it. And then we, we called him up and Spooner was like, yeah, I'd love to do it. And we were like, oh my God, we're going to Alabama. All right, let's have a little listen to... Summer Sun, Spooner style. So we, as you know, like last year we had the best of out, and basically we've released a best of on a best of, which is I don't think anyone's done that before. Yeah. So what we thought was was because we've made this record not chart eligible or anything, because we were like, God, are people really? And the reaction to this record has been really a I bit know. insane, and and I have to be honest, I'm a bit gobsmacked because. You know, we just, we wanted it to be like more like a, a thank you. So we're like, you know, this is, these are songs that have been, we've done through the years. I mean, basically we've done from 89 right through to present day of the new songs. Yeah. And and we were like, maybe you'll find something different, you know, because yeah, singing certain songs, like the, 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 the version of Halo for me is the one that is, was like the most sort of, it was like, whoa, because, you know, Halo as a song was sounded a certain way and it's kind of like very rocky as the record, but this shows the gospel. So when we write the songs, this is how we hear them because when we're it's this raw, but suddenly you're hearing every single word and every little, like, breath and, you know, little me finding my way around Spooner, Spooner found his way around me. All right, let's have a listen to Halo. Can't we- bear it. I can't bear it. It's so good. <laughs> Honestly, because Thank I think you. I think what's happening. This is me, you know me. I'm I know you. Right? I do know so, you. Songs come from somewhere, yeah. right? And we don't necessarily know where they come from. I think this is where they come from. I think that's why it's so special. I think we're hearing the birthplace of the song in the song because of the choir and because of the organ. I think that's the nest. I think, yeah, the rawness because that's the this the rawness oh. of why I saw. Because the most important thing is. What is written yeah. is, you know, it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the songwriting that's the most important thing. And maybe people are going to see a different side of Texas because of the quality of the songwriting, hopefully. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's you know, it's, it's important because the thing is, is when you hear a song, is when I hear someone else's song, it's like the song reflects my life and the people I know and everything about it. And that's what we do with songs. We put our own people into the picture. <sighs> And then the song touches us and that's what makes it yeah. really special to us. I mean, it is, it is, you know, you get amazing producers, don't you? Yeah. Uh, uh, and especially, you know, 80s and 90s, you know, there's walls of sound yeah, coming totally. out. It's in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. But the, the the seed of all that is the song and yeah, this gets us start, back to there, exactly. doesn't it? Exactly. If you start from here yeah. and then put all that stuff on it, you put the fairy dust on it. But in a weird way, we've gone the opposite it's way. deconstruction. So we've basically deconstructed everything and we're like, okay, well, we're showing you the essence of what 
this this the feely dust yeah. is. And, but but with again with a different kind of frame because you know standalone they would be great, but they're even they're, there is a frame here, but it's a softer frame. It's a more ethereal frame. It's like an open sandwich in a New York deli. <laughs> Do you, get, do, you get, do you get an open sandwich in a New York That's deli? That's all you get. Is, yeah, it, yeah, is yeah. it an open sandwich? They're cool sandwiches, but you can't, there's no bread Yeah, anywhere. but is, is there not? Is that an open sandwich? I don't even know what an open sandwich I thought an open sandwich was like one of those Swedish sandwiches. Like, See, I know you, we don't talk about Bryn, your hubby, much, right? Um, but he, oh, he, he crying, does this he's with He's crying food. today. Why, why? Oh, Wales, Wales went oh, out. Way, oh, my match. God. He was in Cardiff last night. He's... Well, he's I watched it in, in Welsh on S4C. I heard the whole thing, uh, but but chefs often deconstruct things. Yeah, and this is it's a bit chefy. Yeah, because what sometimes you're given the the space for the flavours to work, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, totally. Because it's like when you when you cover it all up, sometimes you know you're kind of you you want the big impact first, and that's what the records do. It's, you get that yeah. instant it's a impact. Sell, isn't it? It's yeah. a big sales pitch. Yeah, you go there's the massive impact. Yeah. But when you take it down this way, you go, oh wait a minute, there's something. Something different in this. Yeah, it's I'm like tasting. it's like a lithograph as opposed to like a, an Look oil at us painting. Getting very deep. Well, deep and not deep. It's, yeah. it's 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 you know you're doing to your songs here what Eric Clapton famously did with that first ever MTV Unplugged, and we know what mm. happened after that. Yeah. And Rod Stewart did it. It's not. It's it's your version of that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah you know, th- this could be your biggest selling album of all time. It really, <laughs> could. No, but it really could though. Do you think? I'm, I'm literally looking at you going like that. Oh my God, he's had too many coffees. <laughs> no, I've only had seven, four, yeah. 12. But no, I'm serious. It's out on Friday. And the other thing, it is. there's so much I want to talk to you about to do with this. It's just lovely to have a big, big full on conversation with you about something that we're both really excited about. On, on Friday, It's out on Friday, but I just thought I'd heard it before and I haven't heard it before. I got this, the special encoded watermark link yesterday to listen to the whole album. But I just think I've, I mean, I've heard a lot of Because you know before. the songs, there's, there's a little bit of your psyche that's there that you've known them through and the I've years. And I've seen you do them so many times, yeah, I suppose. And exactly. we, you know, on guitar, backstage, yeah. this kind of stuff. Maybe that's going on. So, But I convinced myself I'd heard this album before and I hadn't. And I was like, I, oh my god! I haven't even heard it. I thought I, that's how it magically is, and in, in the air and around it, it is. But there are two songs I definitely could have heard, heard couldn't have heard before, because they're not Texas songs. So how did you decide which covers to put on? Because um, obviously, myriad covers. You're with the main man Spooner. Mm-hmm. You know he's got all the all the covers in the world in his back pocket that oh. he's played on. Yeah, I mean it's insane. So how did you decide for the two you chosen? Um, we just kind of thought. Yeah, let's you know save the last dance. We were like drifters. Yeah, we would just were like we love that song. Yeah, and it was great because when we recorded that, like Spooner did it with that kind of like sort of he did that sort of, sort of Spanish kind of like sound like Pat Garrett, Bill of the Kids sound. And I always, when we did it after, I thought it had that sort of Linda Ronstadt sort of thing going on like Blue Bio sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. And of course Spooner played on Linda Ronstadt records, so it was like. You know, it was that, and then we did the the um, would I lie to Charles you, the Charles and Eddie cover, which was was um, just a song that uh, that we love. Funnily enough, it was actually Kevin who does our radio promo. It was his first. Kev, who's here? Yeah, Kev, who's here. It was he did he worked on the original, and no it was his way. first gold disc. I think. That's yeah. been there, yeah. Kev. So Back when we when, when, when we told him we were doing, we said, "Oh, we're going to do this as the cover," and he went, "Oh my God, I worked on." I worked on that record. Have I heard you sing that before? Have you done never, that? Never, I've never done it before. See, I'm, I'm convinced. I mean, we're playing it all the time because it's on the playlist. We love it so much. So we'll play that at the end of our chat anyway in full. Yeah. But here's a little bit of Save the Last Dance. Once again, Dance I'm running out of goosebumps. Yeah, this is Actually running out. <laughs> well, you will run out of goosebumps when you hear the story of that actual song because when we did the song, um, Spooner said... Oh, he just started because I never liked to know what a song's about when the, the the writer that wrote it and he says oh yeah you know one of the guys that wrote the, the, the song he says he was in a wheelchair he said and he wrote this song for his wife because he was at a wedding and she was dancing with another man and he says no go and dance and she was dancing with another man but he always knew oh I'm like oh my god I'm gonna go but it was just like so it, it was just like Literally, it was like he knew that he would always have the last dance with her. It's so sad, isn't it? And beautiful. Yeah. Sad and beautiful at the same time. Wow. Don't often see you like this. I know I don't <laughs> often see you like that. I'm like, she was like, 
But you know when you know when someone tells you you know when someone tells you a really beautiful story and you were just like I went I said to Spooner, thank God you never told me that before I sang it. I would have lost I would have just lost it. I would have been like <laughs> But as well when, when we did this, it was like you know, I, I'd said to Spooner after we did it, I went, Oh my god, that I got really excited about that. I said because it's kinda had that Linda Ronstadt thing and he went, Baby, you don't need Linda, you just sang it yourself. Oh, I was like, wow. Oh, but he was like, Spooner was just like, you know, I just love him. He was just like so cool. And you walk around town with him, like we went and bought guitars and everything. And Johnny and I went to the guitar shop and did all this stuff. And everybody's like, Spooner, Spooner, <laughs> Spooner. And you're just like going like, you literally is like, and there was amazing things like when we were in the studio, because when you're in Fame Studios, you got to remember that this is a studio that you've seen in a million Well, just tell us a bit about Fame Studios, if you don't mind. It's just, so Fame is like, I mean, like, there's been so many great records made there. It's like it's notoriously, but it's never changed. I mean, it's literally got like a bit of 10 inch shagpel carpet in it. It's all wood. It just smells of music and musicians and great records and people that have been there. But every day at one o'clock, you literally do a, a walkthrough with the public. So that's how like studios now have to survive is like they literally need to do like tours and everything, even your Abbey Roads, everything. They have to like think out of the box to survive because we don't make records the way we used to. And, you know, it's really important to still have these studios because we do need them for certain things. Um, and basically, um, you would sit there every day eating a sandwich and a cup of tea and, like, people would come through and they would be, like, pointing at us going, oh, my God, there's real musicians. Like, <laughs> and you, re you suddenly remembered, like, you know, you just have that thing of, like, God, that is what we do. We make music for a living. It's, like, insane. It's the best job. It's just insane. It's, like, it's just mad you think... Because then you suddenly become part of the history of that studio. Yeah. And it's like, we made a record there. So it's like, it's just really special. And it's it like really going to Universal Studios tour and you go on a day where they're making a movie and, and they you, really are making exactly, a movie. Exactly. And you're like, <laughs> and then you see the movie and you go, I saw yeah, that I saw getting that. made. <laughs> I saw them doing that. It's what like I really... love about oh, this whole story about this album and you and Johnny and the band is that it's really excited you to the point where you went to the guitar shop and started buying guitars because that's that's a, a reawakening of your excitement about music isn't it you just you know you do it was like you know we sat as i said it w was literally because people go oh, how did you prepare for this record how you did it the honest truth was is we walked into the studio that day and spooner sat on the piano and I sat on the piano stool beside him and tapped out the timing on his leg, literally, and would point at certain bits. And fun enough, what was really interesting is you'll notice that, well, you might not notice, but Inner Smile is not on this album. Right. And Inner Smile is one of our biggest songs. And it was funny because when we came round to doing Inner Smile, Spooner was like, nah. And we were like, and I'm not kidding you, the best bit was is that we just saw the colour draining for a record company guy's face going, this is one of the biggest songs that I'm going to have to go back <laughs> and say it's not on the album. And we were like, oh, Spinner doesn't know what he does. And, and and we were like, why don't you want to do it? And he went, I don't do that Louis, 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 Louis schnizzle. He went, this song's not for me. Which for us meant, oh my God, he really wants to do everything else. But yeah, the record yeah. company were just going, he's not doing an yeah, you know, yeah, it was yeah. like So it was, you know, and we thought, he's doing this because he wants to do it. He really wants to be part of it. And that this. was the vibe. Yeah, and he sent me, he sent Johnny and I a lovely um, email the other night just saying how much he loves the record and stuff. And he's, you know, he's just a cool dude. He still tours with, with Neil Young right now. Yeah. He goes out on the road. I mean, you mentioned some of the people he's worked with. Aretha Franklin, Neil Young, Sheryl Crow, Linda Ronstadt. Um, the list goes on. Amazing, amazing, amazing. When you went to the guitar shop, right? Yeah. What did you buy? We bought a Martin. Right. Um, a really old Martin acoustic. Which and were you is, in the mood where you just had to buy something? Do you know what I mean? There's the problem is is there was loads of stuff. So we're just thinking, what can you we take that you can take on a hand luggage? Because when, when you're carrying guitars and you're carrying really old guitars, you do not want to put them in the hold because yeah, yeah. we've lost so many guitars that way. Not because they get lost, just because they get smashed. Um, and it's such a shame to do that. And, you know, what you got to remember is when they go into the cold, the wood, because it gets so cold, yeah. they just they just split. Once they're gone, they're they gone. Just, they're, they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, yeah. And, you've, you know, you've lost a piece of history. You yeah. know, someone, like, made that beautiful guitar. How big is it? How many guitar shops are around there? Oh, it's, it's Alabama. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on. 
It's like there's not See, much else apart I, I, for like honestly, there's not much else for the, apart from you know guitar shops, um, signage shops. I just and wouldn't come chemists. back. If I were you, I mean, we have to come here to do the show because this is where the state radio station is, and I do love coming here. It's great vibe and it's great energy. But if I had a job, if I was an artist or a writer or something like that, I just I'd go to my favorite place in the world, and that's I'd just do it there. Yeah, I mean, it was it was really beautiful, like just to be there, especially with, with him, because the, you know Spooner is from Muscle Shoals. That's yeah. where he was born, where he grew up. Funnily enough, he was like, do you know, you know, his 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 actual real name is Dewey, which I love that name as well. But because he's like, oh yeah, I get called Spooner when I was a kid, and the nickname was like, why? And he says, oh, because I was playing with a spoon at dinner. He says, and the spoon shot up and hit me in the eyes, blind in one eye. His eye was happened? like, and he get called Spooner ever ever since then. That's what happened. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that either. And it's like, and the thing is, the Spooner doesn't tell you all these stories. You really need to press them. Like, yes, yeah, what what was it like working with Aretha and stuff like this? And he'll be like, oh, I remember when we were doing, um, you know this song or that song whatever he says and they were working out the backing vocals and they were Aretha and her sister were messed around with like, ideas of why they were going to do the backing vocals and suddenly they were going suck it to me suck it to me suck it to me suck it to me like, like, take, like taking the mickey and they were like oh no you should keep that bit it's really good like because they were like going what you want like doing that thing. and they were going suck it to me suck it to me singing along and suddenly like they're like yeah let's put that in the record and he's telling you all this and you're just like going you know, it's like being in a sweet shop for us. We're just going. No, I know. I we're know. going. Oh, tell us more. And you got your own version. I mean, you now have that version of a story because you, you know, your your experience with Spoon is his experience with Aretha. Of course, it is. You know, and it's like a relay race, and you pay it forward and you pass it on. From all the things you've been fortunate enough to experience, where does this rank? Do you think it's? pretty special you know the, uh, making to be honest making records is pretty special because making any record is really special because there's not a lot of people that get the opportunity to do it yeah and and it's something that you it's, it's there it, it can't be erased it's it's there you've made it it's there forever yeah you'll be gone you'll be gone for years after like the people that we list still leave, listen to the music and that person is alive because they've left this you know this this yeah. this behind it's like extraordinary it's an extraordinary like catalog of what you do you know wonder, you've left a mark i wonder if that's what you have in common because um we had uh brian cox in here the other day and i love brian um he was with um D daryl mccormick wasn't he and they're in this new they're they're in the great american play together um, and they're rehearsing for it. They, they were the most too tired people I, we've ever had in the studio because they were in the middle of previews and rehearsing in the day and the play's three and a half hours long. Oh my God. And it's a Eugene O'Neill play from 1939 based in 1912. They brought the weight of of the responsibility in the studio with them. But I was talking to them about about actors, you know, um, no actors really well. Obviously I was married to Billy and I said actors, when they meet, they have this different connection and anybody else who's in the room realises that you're not an actor because those two are and they're having this, this secret, sort of it's like a tacit secret conversation. language. It's like it's just a language yeah. that it's like it's an exchange of, you know, it's just an exchange of an understanding of the dream of what it is you do. You know, you just, it's like, you know, musicians and songwriters were just like, we're probably like the we were, we were most of us little geeky person at school that nobody really sort of cared about, and you know it's it's that it's that geekiness that then transcends into being able to like maybe you're not able to express yourself in a certain way or do it you know speak in a certain way, and suddenly it's like you know forever when I was at school. Every report card that my mum ever got was, Charlene has no understanding of language. I'm like, I'm a songwriter. That's what I do. You know, so maybe it was really good that I had no understanding of language because then I sort of formed this own little language in my yeah. head that became songwriting. So, yeah, there's like, there's that understanding of that geekiness. But also what I was going to say is the fact that, how judgmental is that, by the way? It's just not your language, teacher. There is a, there are many other languages, mm. but I think what I've realised just talking to you today for the first time is that maybe it's because you know, and I could be wrong, 
you know and your fellow musicians know and actors know and their fellow actors know and writers know and their fellow writers know and artists know and their fellow artists know that you are we are only here everything is temporary apart from things that you produce and will be here after you're gone the left and so you have that about you whereas we're all panicking you know, we don't really know. We, there's nothing for us to leave. But you know that you have this sort of... There is a permanence to you your... Don't, yeah, there is, but you don't know you're doing that when you're doing it. No, I know. Which is great. So maybe there's the understanding of... I think as well, there's an understanding of knowing what it's taken to get there. Yeah, yeah. Because that... Uh, with everything, but that's like everything. That's not just with songwriters or actors or, you know, people like that. I think there's an un- when people do certain things, there's an understanding of what it took to get to that yeah. point, and that I think that's sometimes what people connect on, because you know it's like you connect with different people. I don't a lot of people that you know what the sacrifices have been, you know when there's been giant sacrifices made to continue to do what it is you do, yeah. which is really important. You know, it's like when you play live, it's like. Does it look? I remember having a, a conversation with my my best friend's son. And it was like, yeah. Does it look easy when we go on stage? And he's like, yeah. And I says, do you know how how much that takes to make it look like that? Yeah, yeah. Is like literally anything could happen, and, and I I'm like a wind up doll. I just keep going, you know. We just keep going, and that's what gives you the freedom when you do play live. That when you're on the stage, that suddenly you can enjoy the audience. You can play with the audience driven because everything else that's happening round yeah. about it is so stamped into you. you. It's just totally, you just can do it on automatic. Yeah. So everything else that goes with the show yeah. is then you get to play around it. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's so good oh, about it. It's been a great couple of years for you, hasn't it? Well, I mean, it's been amazing. I mean, really playing Glastonbury last year really made everybody kind of sit up and go, oh, wait a minute here. Texas are... Really, I think... <laughs> Yeah, it was that moment, and it was you a bit. For, for, I nearly it. said it because I, I did are get freaking great. I did get I did get the warning before I walked in, and I went, "That could be hard not to swear." But um, yeah, but it is that thing where people are like, "I literally came out of a restaurant last night, and the woman's lied to me." Oh my god, saw you on Glastonbury, but it's great. I mean, the fact that this tour, you know, we're playing the London O2 in September, we're playing two hydros in Glasgow. Yeah. I mean, we're playing a lot of people in September, and we're playing. Cardiff and a Leeds Liverpool. I'm looking at the list here. Bournemouth, it's Birmingham, it's like in all arenas. And you know, the last load of years that we've been hammering it has kind of got us to this point yeah, back no, in these great. arenas and playing these. So please come and see us. Yeah, no, uh, tickets for to go and see Texas Live. Why wouldn't you? Tix dot two slash Texas. That's T I X dot T O slash Texas. Get out there, go and see Charlene. And the band, and just have a fantastic... You won't have a better night. You'll have as good a night maybe watching other bands, but you'll never have a better night, especially now. I think I think the the Glastonbury gig, it did something for you as well, it? Didn't really it really did, it did. What, I mean, what, how would you describe what it did for you? I mean, I think people could see how emotional it was on stage. I mean, I don't know if I'm just to that age where I get... I'm, I'm just like... Ugh. But it was like... the the love that came off the audience because when we went I, I remember before we went on stage I'm thinking okay right we're playing and we're in amongst the, you know we're in amongst the Foo Fighters Royal Blood and um, you know uh, with Alex it, it was just literally like how do we fit in because it's quite indie and blokey so how how are we going to go down in amongst this audience because we knew that like a lot of the people would have been getting ready to come see this and we went on and I thought, you know, they don't even know that they know the Texas songs yet because it was young. I was like, they don't know. And then when we on, I mean, they sang from beginning to end. I was literally, the the the, the force that came off that audience was insane. You, you have been different ever since that gig. Just but, what? Happier? Yeah. Well, I just, whatever it is, it's, it's been, like, it's been, it does, it gives you that it's a stamp, little. It's a stamp of, well, not it's of like approval, you were ta- but, but it was like you were talking about awards. Yeah. Earlier, like before we went on air there, and the thing is, is that it's, it's like it's not about the, the awards, but it's about that recognition of what yeah. you've and and that was a recognition for us of, you know, we have done. It's been thirty five years, and you know, there's not many bands, and certainly not many female fronted bands that have literally 
stayed a lot around that length of time. I think we know what's coming next. Open that door, everybody. A control room. Everything. Oh. <laughs> I thought I was like, I was literally, who's here? <laughs> da, 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 da. For, Charlene, those, for those of a certain age that know that tune. We're way over time. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation. I could talk to it's you literally great. forever. Um, you are in, you've always been in flow, but you're in a different, different level of flow, I think, nowadays. Congratulations. Thank you. It's great to see you. It's always You're the best. Um, right, uh, we, it's time for the news, but you know what? For me, this is the news. Uh, the brand new album from Texas. Uh, here is what I like to you instead of the news. All right? Thank you. 